Okay. It's not turning green. Okay, but it's recording. All right. Welcome to episode number 280 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for you marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. You can find us by searching Beyond Social Media Show. Find all of our channels there. We are recording live on September 13th or 15th, September 15th, 2019. A bunch of things to talk about this week, including Recover Together, Echo Answers, Original Reporting Algorithm, Arrangeable Photos, Zooniverse, Tumblr, Great Pitch, Google Suit, 9-11 Pizza, and a lot, lot more, BL. You always have the honors. What is the best story of the week to kick it off? Well, this is from a Mashable story by Jack Morse. And September is National Recovery Month. And the amazing statistic is the number of people in this country who are in recovery at, at this moment. The Google site points out 23 million Americans are recovering from addiction. That's one in 14 Americans. So what Google has done uh, in coordination with the government released um, two new map related tools that are aimed at aiding people in recovery from drug addiction and helping people to locate the life-saving drug uh, naloxone. Um, so the centerpiece of this is a site called Recovery Together, and it tries to centralize the resources of anybody who wants to overcome addiction. So for example, if you wanted to find a recovery place in Minneapolis, you would click into uh, the, the map on Minneapolis and it would show you um, the recovery locator tool and then the naloxone locator tool as well. And, you know, but it's Google, so there's privacy concerns. And uh, they say that they're not going to associate the website with any specific Google accounts, you know, believe them if you want to. Um, page views, they say, will be measured but not, uh, but anonymized and only in the aggregate. Believe that if you want to. Um, they claim that it won't use any um, naloxone related searches to target ads. Um, but eight of the people who are in recovery include a Google employee and a former White House staffer who are on the site telling their stories. And um, it matters because Google's using its technology and its resources to really do something that government programs never did. And they're taking direct action on a national basis to help solve a crisis. So hopefully it will help a lot of people. That's fantastic. I um, did some work for a, uh, a behavioral healthcare analytics company back in the day, uh, specifically on, on, on addiction. Uh, so the, the, the problem with addiction is that there is, you need a con continuity of, of services, healthcare services through a, like a, a year's worth of time so that people who are who are addicted um, get to their appointments, uh, take the drugs that they're supposed to be taking, go to therapy, and do all those things you need to do to be successful in recovery and not relapse. And that takes a ton of coordinated care to uh, help someone get through that entire uh, entire process. So the goal is just for them not to not to re uh, uh, relapse. Um, and but so, uh, so the, yeah, and the point of the point of, of this this startup was to collect all that data to understand through the analytics where people fall down and where where to put your resources so that people don't fall down. Right in the aggregate, having all that healthcare data will help everyone by understanding how. So you know, there's pluses and minuses to the to the to the. Uh, the data that we're giving up for uh, for that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, it's great to pull those resources together. I'm sure it will be helpful. That startup and Google ought to get together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm sure they wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm <laughs> sure they wouldn't either. Right. Uh, so this, this is, a, I think this is a big story, potentially. This is from Fast Company's Jared Newman. And uh, it's a, I'm going to say echo rather than the wake word for the uh, Amazon echo, because um, if I do, I'll just be triggering everybody's uh, smart speakers throughout the, throughout the podcast. So uh, in, it's supposed to be called uh, wake word answers is the name of the product that, that, uh, uh, that 
Amazon is rolling out, but I'm going to call it Echo Answers for the sake of uh, keeping everybody sane. So Echo's, Echo Answers is a service now that Amazon is rolling out publicly or has rolled out publicly that lets anyone answer questions that are asked by Echo users that Amazon doesn't already have an answer for. Some of the questions um, include things like, like what states around Illinois, uh, what's the proper amount of sleep you should be getting, how many instruments does Stevie Wonder play, how much, uh, how much is in a handle of alcohol, I don't even know what a handle is, so who knows, but, <laughs> but those are the types of questions that people are answering, and uh, Echo will, will uh, you, people can answer it now through, through Amazon's website, and Echo will cite the answer uh, if it chooses to deliver it to users after it's been entered through this website, uh, they'll cite the answer as according to an Amazon customer. So the citation, the source of the answer will be cited as an Am Amazon customer. So Amazon licenses data from hundreds of sources um, to, to answer questions that people are asking, but obviously there are questions that people ask that it doesn't. And Amazon doesn't have the benefit of being Google and having access to the entire index, having indexed the entire World Wide Web, where Google Google's smart speaker can pull answers from, from the web. Um, obviously Amazon doesn't have that set of data, so they're asking for people to submit answers. So you can submit answers, they said, directly to Amazon's website uh, you can view pending queries that, that Amazon is listing that people are asking and enter your response in 300 characters or less. Um, Amazon isn't requiring any kind of citation in their responses. Uh, so really the only quality control thing is upvoting by, by participants in the, in this, an, in this echoes answers thing. Um, I saw a lot of, I signed up for it. I saw a lot of uh, food related questions, not surprisingly. Another question was how many Yankees are in the hall of fame to which I answered, but uh, my, my preferred answer was far too many. <laughs> actually, actually it's 60. So there you go. Um, but I, I see a real opportunity here for Amazon, whether they're going to capitalize on it or not, they could in, they could uh, invite subject matter experts, known subject matter experts to submit answers in their own voice rather than, so what, when you type in the response to one of these questions, it, uh, it, it, uh, you can listen to the echo recited in its mechanical voice. But what they should do is uh, allow subject matter, subject matter experts, such as ourselves, to answer questions on marketing, for instance, in our own voice by recording an audio uh, answer and then giving us the credit, giving us the citation. That would motivate subject matter experts to contribute their expertise to it as a branding and expert expert positioning thing. The Another idea they could do is use the uh, Q&A schema protocol to collect answers from experts and allow them to uh, to uh, submit a feed of those those uh, answers uh, directly to Amazon. But something worth, what, worth watching, another uh, development in the audio marketing sphere. Well, I bet they'll get to those things. You know? I, would hope, I hope so. Yeah, I bet they will. And um, I, have, I have another Google story. <laughs> um, and I think this one also is potentially important. And um, this is from a, um, a Google blog post and also uh, from a story in uh, the New York Times by Mark Tracy. And, you know, the 24-7 news cycle has had a really bad effect on uh, original stories because the minute a story that a reporter may have spent months researching appears 4,000 other stories report on that story and sometimes the original story is lost in the process so Google says they want to highlight the original story this may have a really excellent effect on on uh, mainstream journalism publishers have been complaining about this issue for years because they work forever on their story and then everybody else recycles their scoop. So Richard Gingras, who's Google's vice president of news, says it means readers interested in the latest news can find the story that started it all and publishers can benefit from having their uh, original material more widely seen. And they say they're going to elevate outlets that are known for history of accurate reporting, which would include considering metrics like um, Pulitzer Prizes and other journalism awards. Um, Google says they're putting increased effort into how do we do right by local outlets as well, because many times the story will uh, originate in a local outlet and then get picked up by a national outlet and a little local outlet gets uh, buried. So why this matters is that Google, Facebook, and YouTube have often been criticized 
from highlighting the sensational inflammatory content clickbait in the short run. And um, for example, uh, YouTube let videos accusing the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School um, in Parkland, Florida, be accused of being crisis actors. So is this going to help? You know, don't forget that all the big platforms exist to make money, but it remains to be seen if this is going to remove it's going to move the needle toward more substantial journalism. Hopefully it will. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they have, Google has a lot of uh, um, systems in place to identify when, I mean, they know when something, they know the first time something is published. So they know that a story is public, like, you know, the Washington Post or a local, local newspaper publishes an original article. They have a date stamp on when, that, when that, um, that piece of content has been published. So they know the original source of the story or they can know the original source of the story. And then they've, if you look at Google News, you often see a highly cited article that Google like labels it highly cited. So they know that other people are talking about that particular article through, you know, when other people report to it, credible news outlets report that originally reported by whoever was the original source of it, often linking to it as well. There's a lot of signals in place for them to do this. And, uh, and I think the crucial point is the local, local, as you said, you know, the local coverage uh, gets published. They're the original source of the story, but then national publics, publications pick up on it because their reach, their scale, they're going to get more of the traffic to it. So uh, hopefully this will, do, will help local news outlets uh, much more. Than, Definitely uh, a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a step in the right direction. This has nothing to do with news, unless you're posting photos of news. This is from uh, First Post, uh, who uh, reports that Twitter users can now, um, you can now add up to four images to a specific tweet. And then after you've uploaded it, you can tap and hold a picture to select it and arrange your photographs. So when you have a, you know, a carousel, or not a carousel, but arrangement, uh, a gallery of four photos, you can now uh, within at the time you're composing your tweet, arrange the photos in the way that you want them arranged. Uh, that's rolling out now, or has rolled out to to every to Twitter users everywhere. Uh, and then they all, this article also notes that report that uh, Twitter has reportedly been working on the ability to schedule t tweets natively, which was a glaring uh, omission. Now you have to use like TweetDeck or, or Hootsuite or. or or some other social media management uh, tool to schedule tweets. It'd be awful nice to uh, just be able to do that within Twitter itself. I like that. I hope that comes to me soon. I haven't gotten it yet. Um, I have uh, the story that I have now is about being a scientist. Uh, more than a million people, including me, have become citizen scientists using Zooniverse. It's the world's largest crowdsourcing project. And this is from a Washington Post story by Aaron Blakemore. And um, this is an example. Uh, today I got one that said, we're currently running a disaster relief project to help in the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian. We need your help to look through before and after satellite images of the stricken areas in the Bahamas. The information will be passed to Rescue Global, our first responder partners on the ground, who will use it to guide their aid efforts. And so then you can go to um, uh, look at what has already been done and get examples of what they want you to do. You have to download uh, the Planetary Response Network um, in the Google Play Store or Apple. Um, and they know from previous projects that people are really good at picking up on subtle changes and that these are due to real differences on the ground instead of changes due to lighting or haze that can put a uh, color cast on an image. When people look at these we're able to tell if it's a real change, which is really amazing. So it may not be possible to spot moderate damage, they say, but severe catastrophic damage will be noticeable. So I'm giving that one a try and imagine that a million people can be helping. That's pretty cool. I wouldn't necessarily call you citizen uh, scientists, though, more like um, scientific interns. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever, you know. <laughs> but it's fun to participate and, you know, we yeah. can do good. Yeah, that's cool. Um, 
so this this was uh, this was we neglected to mention this uh, story uh, in the last episode, but I want to talk about it because it's important. Uh, the Washington Post Rachel Siegel reports on uh, Tumblr's uh, sale. So Tumblr uh, was bought or Tumblr was sold for one point one billion dollars in 2013 to Yahoo. And uh, an automatic, the owner of uh, WordPress, just recently bought it for just three million dollars. So really? Tumblr, Tumblr was bought by by WordPress basically for for three million dollars. A far cry from the one point one billion that Yahoo paid for it. Um, Tumblr founder David Carp, uh, he he's quoted in this article. He's, uh, he said he he started Tumblr to deliberately not compete with WordPress with long form content. There's a quote in it, um, it has him saying, I had all these cool videos, links and projects that I wanted to put out there and had a really hard time doing it. I wanted to do something different. I was determined not to compete with WordPress. Of course, Tumblr is a short form, highly visual. So a lot, most of the, most of the uh, Tumblr posts are images or videos. Um, Automatic Chief Executive Matt Mullenweg told the Wall Street Journal that he is uh, he, he sees the site as complementary to WordPress. A quote in quote from him says it's just fun. We're not going to change it, any of that. Uh, that remains to be seen. I think Tumblr has 452 million blogs on the on the site, uh, and then 30 percent of websites use WordPress. So, you know, there's obviously there's an acquisition of users for Word, WordPress gets an acquisition of users from Tumblr. Um, the, the acquisition diversifies the content uh, because WordPress is more long form uh, typically than, uh, than the highly visual uh, t Tumblr. Um, and then there's content for WordPress RSS feed reader. So this is a often overlooked aspect of WordPress, but it your WordPress account acts as a feed reader as well. So it can provide more content for that feed. Um, but I just think this is interesting. We'll see how it works out. I've kind of, I had kind of, kind of given up on Tumblr. Uh, if you do, if you do uh, uh, a lot of uh, social listening, a lot, there's a lot of spam in Tumblr and, uh, and kind of useless, useless content because, uh, because most of the highly trafficked uh, uh, posts on Tumblr are basically retweets or reblogs. Re um, so we'll see if uh, WordPress can clean that up and resurrect Tumblr. It'll be interesting to watch, but those two big platforms merging is, is considerable and bears watching. I believe Tumblr predated um, uh, Instagram. And uh, I think that it, it sort of lost favor because it didn't, have the same, um, you know, options. Um, and and then back in the day, you had to have a Tumblr blog, you know, it was like really important to be there. And then it's just sort of lost favor. You know, it's like Medium uh, is a great place, uh, but not enough people, I think, are reading it. A lot of people are writing on it. I don't know if there are enough people reading it. But Do you, re do you remember Posteris? No. Posteris, Posteris was came along the same. There came along after Tumblr, I think. Uh, Posteris was a far better Tumblr, but they just they for whatever reason they didn't survive and and eventually just closed up shop. But it was fantastic. I loved Posteris. Oh, you know, I I feel like it's always my job to try every new platform that comes along, and I miss that one. Yeah. So I got this week. I mean, those of us who do PR, and and those of us who are on the receiving end of PR. <laughs> will understand that follow-up pitches are part of life, but this is a great follow-up pitch that I got this week. Instead of the usually, did you get it? Or, or the whining kind of emails, you know, I, this is the third time I got in touch with you, why aren't you answering me? So this one came from a guy named Johnny Tran at WP Engine, I'm gonna read it to you. It said, hi BL, I've tried to connect with you a few times, but haven't heard back, which means one of three things. A, your website is in great condition and I should stop bothering you. B, you need help with your site but haven't had time to get back to me. C, you've been abducted by aliens. In that case, let me know and I'll call for help. Please let me know what your radio silence means. I'm getting a bit worried. <laughs> I kind of feel like I've heard that one before. Oh, no, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I haven't. And it wasn't to me. And I thought it was a great, you know, I thought that was a great approach. I mean, anytime there's humor, 
yeah. it's a great approach. Yeah. <laughs> got a kick That's out true. of that. So I'm out of bad, out of good news, Dave. You got All right. Me? Well, I got it. Let's go into the bad one. I got a really, a really bad one potentially. I think uh, you can decide. Some people might put this in good, um, but we can talk about it. Uh, this is from an Inc. article by Jason Atten, but a lot of people have reported that attorneys general from 48 states, the uh, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have announced that they're investigating Google over their dominance of the online advertising market. Uh, so Google accounts for 90% of all searches online. Um, the question is, what do you do about it? Um, so if, you know, I mean, one, when, when you look at past episodes of attorneys general uh, uh, suing a big tech company is the, the one that everybody cites is Microsoft, uh, where they broke up, they tried to break up the, uh, the, um, the browser from the operating system uh, when, when Microsoft was competing with, uh, with um, Netscape. Uh, they failed at that, uh, but the solution usually is to break up a company. So if you break up Google, the search from other parts of Google, if you make it its own entity, it completely breaks uh, breaks advertising. It breaks a lot of things. The, the article cites that you know, the only reason that search is free or the email and Chrome and, and search are free is because of the ad business that Google runs. If you take away the, if you, if you remove Google ads from search or YouTube from search or and all of those things work together, which is why the advertising is so effective. Um, so I don't know what the solution is because there's nobody else to provide that solution. There really isn't any competition, um, but it makes, if you break it up, it makes advertising far less effective, much more annoying because we're going back in time basically uh, because it's, five, it's far less, less, um, less effective. So if you're, at, if you're a business and you're using advertising, most people are using digital advertising these days, you have three options. There's Google for search, there's Facebook for social targeting, and there's Amazon for e-commerce targeting. And that's kind of it. Uh, but they're all three highly effective forms of advertising because of the data set that they have in order to target uh, target users for relevant ads. Uh, the privacy issue is another thing. So if you can solve the privacy issue without breaking up the companies, then maybe that's the solution, but I don't know how you do that. I don't think anybody knows how you do that, you know, and I think that uh, this week, when Google was fined, what, $170 million, which is probably what they make in three minutes. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was a slap on the wrist. And, and meanwhile, they, they fined Facebook $5 billion, which was also a slap on the wrist for them. But, uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that either. But frankly, I don't really think big tech needs to be broken up at this point in time. Do you? I don't, but I mean, that's what else, what else is the solution? If you're going to, if you're, if you're the attorneys general of all these states and you want to, uh, I mean, right now it's just an investigation, right? But they clearly, they are clearly monopolies. So, you know, traditionally what you do with a monopoly is break it up. Yes, but when you got um, Facebook in front of Congress and you saw how completely clueless our congressional representatives are about social media and the internet. You wonder, like, are the attorneys general any more clued in on what's actually happening? Yeah, so, well, I, so, so the I difference. The answer to that. Yeah, the difference, though, there is the, uh, you know, the uh, attorneys general are uh, presumably have more uh, access to to company files because they have the power of law behind their themselves. I mean. Presumably, Congress can do the same, but maybe they're just, you know, <laughs> not as effective. And you look at the the attorneys general model is big tobacco and pharma, right? Where they've been successful. I mean, in Minnesota, we had Mike Hatch who went after the tobacco companies and got a huge settlement uh, that went into uh, went went into helping people stop smoking. I actually took advantage of that that uh, settlement and, and helped me quit smoking. But you know, there's a track record with attorneys general where there isn't with uh, the federal government. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, attorney general, attorneys general are more likely to get things done. The question, of course, is, is this something that needs to be done? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I do not have more uh, bad news, but um, I also was aware of the one you're going to tell us now. And it was very distressing to me. 
Yeah, this is a this is a quick one. Um, this is uh, from Business Insider's Kate Taylor, who reports that lead a company called Lido Pizza, a restaurant uh, that specializes in square pizzas, and they have roughly a hundred locations. They tweeted on 9-11, hashtag never forget. They tweeted a photo of a square pizza of theirs topped with olives and pepperoni to look like an American flag and then quickly uh, deleted it. But of course, nothing gets deleted from the internet. People screenshotted it. Uh, they later followed up with a tweet featuring an American flag. Um, but, you know, I mean, if your company doesn't have a, or brand doesn't have a direct connection to 9-11, just shut up. Just don't do anything. That's for sure. Oh my That's God. I mean, it's just. Every year. It yeah. Happens. Every year. There's some company that does some tasteless crap on 9 11. And, you know, 9 11 this year, I decided I was just going to stay offline because I didn't want to see it. I really didn't. So that brings us to um, shiny objects, right? It does. What do you got, Bill? I got a good one. Um, you know, facial recognition is an issue. Um, and we talked last week in episode 279 about the fact that Facebook said they're not automatically going to do facial recognition for new users, but those of us who've been on Facebook for a while have to check our privacy settings. So now um, a Polish artist named Iwa Nowak has created a solution. Um, for <laughs> it's very elegant and it's uh, minimalist and it's an abstract mask that you wear on your face. It's called incognito, and it fixes to the front of your face and makes you unrecognizable to the camera, and it's accompanying software. It's like polished pieces that deflect the software that is supposed to detect who you are. I think that's hilarious, and I want one. So are they, what, are these ma what do the masks look like? Um, it, it's just sort of jewelry on your face, but it like covers your nose and your mouth. Like, and it just not covers it so you can't talk. I, I'll put a picture of it in the show notes, but it's, you know, it's just so funny. It's funny, but I don't really want to wear a mask while I'm surfing. It's not like a regular mask. It's like a piece of jewelry on your face. Okay. I'll take a look <laughs> at it. <laughs> uh, mine is, this is for developers, web developers. Uh, so very select uh, group of people. Yeah, I'm getting geeky. This is called HTML5 Outliner. It is a, a Chrome uh, extension that allows you to upload a file, paste in some, some code, or input a URL. And uh, you get what you get is an outline of the document structure of a given web page or the code or the file that you've uploaded. Uh, just to, uh, to so when you're trying to diagnose diagnose uh, how somebody built a give, a page, this is helpful. Or if you're trying to uh, to uh, you know you've got a web project you're working on trying to figure that somebody else has coded, you figure out how they put something together. This is a nice tool to do that. Uh, that was very geeky, and I love when you get geeky, Dave. <laughs> um, that brings us to the daily numbers. It does. So uh, this is uh, video content promotion platforms. Um, so the top video content promotion platforms will not be surprised. You will not be surprised by these. Facebook tops the list, followed by Instagram, followed by YouTube, followed by LinkedIn. So all the social platforms are, uh, are loving video now. So that's obviously a place that people are going to promote it. Um, followed by online banner ads, which was surprising to me. That's a paid option. Obviously people don't do that organically. Uh, followed by Twitter, uh, followed by content placement on external sites. So that's like native advertising probably. Snapchat, company website or blog, and then email. I was, I was surprised that email was so far down the list. And that's, I think, an overlooked aspect of, of video promotion, uh, especially if you've got a, if you're trying to build a YouTube channel uh, and you've got, you've got a, a big uh, uh, email list, getting people to, to um, engage with your video shortly after it's posted in a large way, email is the way to do that because that's going to send all kinds of signals. People aren't going to catch it through going to their YouTube channel and seeing it in the feeds and anything. The most direct way to reach your audience and get them to engage with your video uh, is through email. So I, I was kind of surprised that that was so far down the list. That is surprising. So um, that brings us to the end of episode 280 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And you'll find us by searching, just search Beyond Social Media Show 
Um, links to everything we talked about today will be on beyondsocialmediashow.com slash 280. And uh, I am here with my charming co-host, David Erickson, who's on Twitter as D. Er D. Erickson. Instagram, he's D. E. Erickson. On YouTube, he's E. Strategy. And he blogs at the wonderful E. Strategy blog.com. I am B.L. Offman with a cold. I'm on um, <laughs> Twitter as What's Next. My blog is What's Next Blog. And uh, I'm on YouTube as What's Next Blog. And my puppy, <laughs> My puppy Lucy is on Instagram as Lucy the Rescue Puppy, and she's starting to get quite a nice following. Um, <laughs> the show, beyond social media show com, and on Twitter, we're at BS Media Show because we don't always take ourselves totally seriously. And we thank you for watching today. We'll be back next week. Thanks for watching.